I am Evan Schlafmitz from St. Francis Hospital in Rosalind, New York, and today we'll discuss OCT-guided PCI. These are my disclosures. Performing high-quality OCT can be broken down three different stages. First is image acquisition. Second is being able to interpret the image. And last is applying the information provided by the OCT to guide your PCI. Now that you've acquired an image, next up is interpreting the image. Here we have an OCT cross-section of a normal coronary artery. We have the catheter, which runs along the guide wire, and there's always guide wire artifact shadowing alongside the catheter. Due to the high quality resolution of an OCT catheter, we're able to see the three distinct layers of a coronary artery wall. We have the intima as labeled, the media with its inner elastic lamina, and the outer external elastic lamina, and lastly, the adventitia. To determine what type of plaque is present, the first thing you want to do is evaluate if the EEL, or external elastic lamina, that outer dark portion of the media, can be visualized. If it can be visualized, it's either a normal coronary artery segment where there's fibrous plaque. If you cannot identify the EEL, the first thing you want to do is determine if the signal change is occurring in the lumen or in the wall. Once you've determined if the signal change is within the lumen or the wall of the artery, the next thing you want to do is determine if you can draw a line around the area where there's signal change. So if there's signal change within the lumen, if you can draw a line around the area of the signal change and it's well demarcated, you know you're looking at white thrombus. Whereas if you're unable to identify where the signal change ends, it's red thrombus when that signal change is within the lumen. And that's because the OCT catheter, if you think of it as a red light, is unable to penetrate through the red blood cells and red thrombus. In the event there's signal change that's occurring in the wall of the vessel, you apply that same algorithm. If you can draw a line around the signal change, you know it's calcium. Whereas if you're unable to see the border of the signal change, you know the plaque has to be lipid. A high resolution with OCT allows you to precisely measure the cap thickness in the presence of lipid. Though you can't detect past the lipid to see the plaque burden and the thickness of li lipid due to the high attenuation that occurs with OCT in the presence of lipid. One distinct advantage of OCT, however, in the presence of calcium, you're able to measure the thickness of calcium which has important clinical implications. So while image interpretation may seem overwhelming at first, you simply can break it down to two steps. First, identify if the signal change is occurring in the lumen or in the wall of the vessel. Next, you see whether or not you could clearly outline the signal change. And this is important because determining the predominant lesion morphology will determine what your strategy is for PCI. If it's lipidic plaque, you often can go with a direct stenting approach, whereas fibrotic plaque, you want to predilate with a compliant balloon. Mild to moderate calcium will need either non-compliant balloon, cutting balloon, or scoring balloons. And for severe calcium, which OCT is very sensitive at detecting, you either want an atherectomy or intravascular lithotripsy approach where available. 
we've summarized the workflow for integrating OCT into your PCI by the acronym MLD-MAX. MLD-MAX is broken into two phases. There's the baseline OCT, which is what's used to strategize your entire PCI. The M stands for morphology. You want to identify lesion morphology. Next, you determine length of the lesion, and that'll determine the stent length you choose. And lastly, for the pre-PCI OCT is diameter, and choosing the stent diameter, as well as the post-dilatation balloon diameter. After you've implanted a stent and then everything needed to optimize that stent, you repeat OCT pullback. And with the post-PCI OCT, you assess if there's any areas that are needed for optimization. The M stands for medial dissection. A is for apposition. And lastly, the X is expansion, which is the most important metric that'll determine future outcomes. For the baseline OCT, it doesn't necessarily have to be a true baseline. If it's difficult to cross with an OCT catheter or high degree stenosis, you can predilate with a small balloon, a 2O or 2.5 millimeter balloon to facilitate crossing with an OCT catheter. The key is you want to perform OCT prior to selecting your stent. And this is so that you can optimize the stent implantation strategy as well as select the precise stent for that lesion. For morphology, the predominant plaque that you want to identify always before implanting a stent is calcium. You want to make sure you exclude high degree of calcium. If there's a high degree of calcium, you need to incorporate a lesion preparation modality so that you're able to not only deliver the stent, but make sure you can get adequate expansion. And we determine high calcium to be based on the CVI score or calcium volume index. And this could be remembered by the rule of fives. If more than 50% of the arc has calcium, it's greater than 180 degrees, and the calcium thickness is greater than 0.5 millimeters, and that's something that can only be measured on OCT, and if the calcium length extends for five millimeters or more, you know there's a high degree of calcium and that is unlikely to have adequate stent expansion if lesion preparation is not incorporated prior to stent implantation. After determining if there's severe calcification, you then choose the stent length and stent diameter. While multiple stent sizing algorithms have been proposed, we advocate for using the Illumian criteria. So if the EEL can be visualized for more than 180 degrees, you use the EEL at the distal reference and round down to the nearest available stent diameter to select your stent size. The measurement should be repeated at the proximal reference, and this is what's used to determine your post-dilatation balloon diameter. Following stent implantation, you want to assess if there's any areas that require further optimization. You'll notice when you start doing OCT, you're going to appreciate dissections, malapposition, tissue protrusion that wouldn't be angiographically apparent. And just because you identify it doesn't mean that it requires treatment. Using the MLD Max acronym and workflow, it will guide when you need to treat dissections and apposition. So M for medial dissection, we advocate for treating dissection, typically if it's greater than one quadrant and it penetrates into the medial layer. If that's the case, it usually requires an additional stent. But if it's a small intimal dissection where the flap is less than one quadrant, it typically does not require further treatment. OCT software has automatic stent malapposition detection. And most malapposition does not need to be treated. Typically, if it's greater than three millimeters and greater than 0 0.3 millimeters from the wall, it may require further treatment, which typically can be uh, treated with a semi-compliant balloon at low pressure. Lastly is expansion. 
This is the most important as stent expansion has the best correlation with future stent related outcomes. So we consider acceptable at least 80% compared to the respective reference segment, greater than 90% stent expansion being considered optimal. If you have not achieved at least 80% stent expansion, you want to post dilate with non compliant balloons. So it's important to perform high quality OCT guided PCI. You always want to image both before and after stent implantation. You want the imaging to guide your decision making. The imaging shouldn't be an afterthought, but use the information from the OCT pullback to plan your PCI to determine when further optimization is required. And doing that, you'll soon begin to appreciate that OCT is an essential component of performing high-quality PCI. Thank you very much.